Thank you. Um, welcome to this afternoon's session on um, uh, estates, infrastructure, and personnel. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Malcolm Davis. I joined ASPE in January as senior analyst in defence strategy and capability. Uh, so I'm used to dealing with things like F-35s, future submarines, and future frigates. So estates, infrastructure, and people is a bit of a challenge for me, but I will hopefully do a good job up here. Um, we have three excellent speakers uh, this afternoon to take us through this area, and it's an important area. Um, if you look, there are two key quotes that I, I would like to start with, and the first is that amateurs talk tactics, but professionals talk logistics. And so we are very much talking logistics here this afternoon. And the second one is that a great man once said, um, an army marches on its stomach. And so logistics really matters in terms of achieving the goal of military power, which is to achieve victory in war. Now, that didn't save Napoleon at Waterloo, but it's still um, accurate today. And I think Defence White Paper 16 recognises the importance of logistics, uh, infrastructure, estate and people as key enablers for achieving its strategic objectives. What it's seeking to do is to update our infrastructure uh, to support the new capability development that's coming online with the, the future force structure that's being proposed both in the Defence White Paper 16 and also in the Integrated Investment Program. It's also looking to improve and increase the number of people that we have in defence. And so personnel is of critical importance. Um, it's not just a throwaway line to say that personnel is at the heart of defence. Uh, if we have F-35s, if we have future submarines, if we don't have the right people operating those platforms, then we don't have an effective defence capability. So getting the personnel mix right, getting the personnel levels right, and getting the infrastructure correct is really important because that ultimately gives us the best um, uh, bang for buck ratio in terms of our capabilities in the future. And if you look at the defence white paper, 25% uh, you know, of the integrated investment plan goes into these critical enablers including developing new ports, wharves, airfields, uh, and logistics capabilities. And this is a huge amount of uh, issue uh, and capability that we're looking at. The Defence Estate is 600 sites uh, with 30,000 assets valued at $68 billion. So this is uh, a large issue that we have to get right. Um, we also have to plug and play in with the US force posture review, uh, and that's another critical factor that I hope we can talk about today, because hopefully, in spite of concerns about a potential President Trump reversing the rebalance, um, the rebalance does in fact continue, gathers pace and deepens. That's the ultimate ideal outcome. So Australia has to pay, play a part in that in terms of generating regional pool for the US to sustain that US push into the region. And that means uh, balancing our desire to develop long-term infrastructure and estates uh, capability and building personnel uh, um, mixes that are correct versus sustaining the existing operational um, uh, facilities. In terms of the personnel side of things, the, uh, the ADF workforce is going to grow under the Defence White Paper to 62,400 through to fiscal year 2025-2026. And that means a, a growth of about 2,500 people. But it's not just about more people, as I said, it's about getting the right balance, the right people with the right skills. It's about getting a smart workforce. So we have three um, excellent uh, speakers to take us through uh, these, these issues. Firstly, we have um, uh, Steve G, as I'm going to call him, because if you look at, his, look at the um, uh, program for today, his last name is a little bit complicated to say. Uh, but everyone calls him Steve G. Um, he's had um, a long history with personnel, estates and inf infrastructure in both the UK and Australia. He moved down here in 2001 and has worked as a SES level within uh, Department of Defence uh, since then. Uh, firstly, as Director General uh, Occupational Health and Safety from 2004 and then uh, as D Director General Personnel Policy and Employment from 2006. In 2008, he became the head of uh, people policy in the People Strategies and Policy Group. And in 2013, he became Deputy Secretary of Defence Support and Reform 
and then ultimately Dep Deputy Secretary of State and Infrastructure as of July 2015. Then we have the Honourable uh, Miss Guy Broadman, uh, Broadman MP, who's the Shadow Parliamentary Secretary of Defence. She has extensive experience in public and private and community sectors, including in small business, and has worked with DFAT and as well as the Attorney Generals. Guy has extensive involvement in volunteer work at the senior administration level and is a fellow of the Public Relations Institute of Australia and a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. She's the co-chair of the Parliamentary Library Committee and a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Public uh, 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 Accounts and Audit. And finally, uh, my colleague at ASPE, uh, Lisa Sharland, is a senior analyst focusing on Australian engagement on UN peacekeeping, peace support operations and peace support operations reform, as well as women in defence and security, and also is a, a key thinker in Australia-Africa engagement. She's undertaken field research on UN peace support operations in South Sudan and Central African Republic with the uh, Stimson Centre in Washington, D.C. And she's also worked as Defence Policy Advisor at the UN Permanent Mission for Australia. I welcome you all and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this in, these important issues. Steve, perhaps if you want to take us off with the first presentation. Uh, thanks, Malcolm. Um, and look, first thing is it's uh, great to be here. And somewhat unusual, and it's the second time this sort of thing has happened to me in recent months. On the day of the launch of the White Paper, the Secretary of Defence said to me, Steve, can you just stand, uh, stand up and give a presentation to the senior leaders of defence and talk to them a bit about the enablers and what's going on in the White Paper? Um, and, and he did that because the enablers are such a strong feature of the White Paper that has been released this time. And certainly in my 15 years in defence, uh, which spans several White Papers, I haven't seen such a strong emphasis on the enablers um, in a white paper before. So I think that's why I'm here uh, and very happy to be here. So when we talk enablers, we're talking a range of things. Um, the slide shows um, around 25% investment over the next decade in what we call enablers. So it is, um, as has been mentioned, estate, um, ICT, uh, logistics, uh, health uh, and people. Uh, and we're talking capital investment uh, in this case. So it's a significant, um, a significant moment for us uh, in terms of uh, planning to go forward with um, re-enabling, re if you like, or reinvigorating the enablers. And two years ago, when we started working on the white paper, I sort of steeled myself for a bit of, a, bit of an argument about trying to get enough money for the enablers and found, to my great pleasure, that um, the argument was fairly straightforward. Um, it's fair to say that in defence, there is universal agreement across all of the senior leaders, the three service chiefs, the VCDF, Deputy Secretary Strategy, etc., that um, we needed to do more on the enablers and it was going to be a priority. And it was a priority that, as a leadership cohort, we were going to defend. Uh, and that is what's happened and that's what we see in the white paper. Um, so the white paper has given us in the estate $26 billion over the decade. I'll talk primarily about the estate, and um, that's my world. Um, just a quick rundown, uh, Malcolm gave you some of the figures. Defence estate's probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest in Australia, three million hectares under management, and that's not including uh, the Woomera uh, weapons range. Uh, 600 sites, within that about 60 major defence bases and a lot of training areas and a lot of smaller sites. Um, around 30,000 individual building assets uh, across that estate, um, ranging from buildings at Anglesey Barracks in Tasmania, which are 200 years old, to brand new facilities at a place like East Sale, where we've just recently opened uh, new uh, gymnasiums and recreational facilities. Also in the white paper, an increase to our maintenance funding. So as opposed to the capital reinvestment funding, the, uh, the annual maintenance line, a total of nearly $12 billion over the decade, represents a significant increase compared to current um, budgets. So I guess the question is, um, why, why did we need to do this? Um, and this is the slide that I've been using for a while. This shows that um, with the investment we've been making in the estate since um, the, year 2000, the year 2000, um, the remaining average useful life 
of the collective assets on the defence of state has reduced. So it's reduced from around 22 years to around 15 years, and that's happened in a period of less than 15 years. Clearly, if we continue investing at the same rate that we have been, we are in an unsustainable trajectory. So this is the, this is the evidence we've used. Um, this long-term underinvestment is clearly unsustainable. I keep trying to encourage the next slide to come on. Um, I call this the gelato chart. It lives on the wall in my office, um, and I won't go into it in fine detail. But it starts at now and ends at 10 years' time. The important features of this chart are, firstly, that it's going up. And, of course, that represents the increased uh, funding that, that will gradually come in over the next decade into the estate. Um, the next feature I'd point out is green versus pink. Um, green uh, is what I call uh, the estate sustainment funding. This is, this is money that we use to go into a base and do a, um, a periodic refresh. So we might go into, uh, as we are at Campbell Barracks in the west at the moment, we're going to spend $270 million and we're not adding any capability to the base. We're replacing all of the underground you know, sewage, water, gas, electricity. We'll replace the accommodation, we'll replace the mess, we might replace some of the workshops, but fundamentally we're just putting in place new what is currently very old. Um, and that is where we've been underinvesting in the past. If you look at the left-hand edge of this chart, you'll see that pink dominates green. Pink is what we used to call um, estate projects related to the defence capability plan. So facilities associated with a joint strike fighter or with a particular uh, new uh, vehicle for the army. And what's been happening is that we've been focusing on, on uh, the DCP related works, which tend to add assets onto an estate, um, but without refreshing any of the fundamental services that you need to keep refreshed. So you can see over time that there is a drift um, away from dominance by pink to dominance by green, um, and that will give us the ability to refresh um, the estate over the next decade or so. That's the first prong of a three-prong strategy articulated in the white paper, recapitalization of the estate. The second prong of that strategy is um, a serious attempt to rationalize the defense estate. Um, and uh, first raised with this government in the first principles review around a year ago and reiterated in the white paper, um, we are looking at adjusting the defence estate footprint um, to a smaller footprint over time uh, as we can. And in fact, in the last nine months or so, we've seen the government agree to a couple of property disposals, the Limba Barracks in Brisbane, um, Lewin Barracks in the West, uh, and a couple of smaller properties that are now being marketed for uh, disposal to enable those properties to be used for alternative uh, and productive uh, community use. So that is the second sort of pillar of the um, uh, recapitalization strategy. And the third pillar, as I mentioned before, is to increase our um, effort on estate maintenance. Um, it's, uh, it's an area where in the past we've uh, been lean funded uh, and now we see um, increasing budgets going forward so we're able to more properly maintain the buildings and assets uh, that we do have on the estate. One of the other features in the white paper is uh, a focus on operating the north. This is the Bradshaw training area. Uh, up in the Northern Territory. Um, and this will include investments around um, training areas, not just in the North, but uh, around Australia, um, around things like explosive ordnance stores, uh, fuel facilities, uh, which are uh, highly technical and very expensive to, to run well. Um, in the North, in particular, naval berthing capacity for the future. And of course, the US Marine Rotational Force and the work that we'll have to do to uh, accommodate that as it grows into the future. So all these things are covered in the white paper. Um, most of the really big moves, the white paper talks about possibly building new, new naval facilities and new Air Force facilities in the future. Most of those moves would be contemplated in, in the longer term, certainly beyond the first decade, but planning for those things will start to gear up towards um, in this first decade. One of the key issues for us is, um, is stability of funding. Uh, and this white paper uh, gives us that stability of funding. The projects that we run, uh, base redevelopments, um, major infrastructure around capability, um, they, they take three or four years to, to build and sometimes two to three years to plan. So we're looking at timescales of you know, between five and seven years, for example, to build the facilities you need 
uh, to support a joint strike fighter or to completely upgrade a defence base somewhere. So we need future stability of funding and that's what, um, that's what we've got. Also, we've got the challenge of ramping up our efforts. The uh, Gelato chart earlier uh, showed a very significant increase in investment um, and we've got plans on how we do that. And, it, and it's, it's not about doing more projects more often. Uh, it's about doing larger programs of work uh, and making projects bigger than they are um, and leveraging off industry's capability to deliver those projects for us. So all that's planned. It's in the integrated investment program um, and um, should give us an ability over time because right now we're in reactive mode for a lot of our work. So we're doing work on wharves in Garden Island that we were doing as an emergency work because um, the wharves have not been maintained when they should have been 10 years ago uh, and that need urgent work. So we're currently reactive and we're going to move progressively to planned over the next couple of years. And just finally, um, this is the Bradshaw training area. That's the only bridge into the training area. This is a picture in the dry season. The reason why we're also investing in training areas down in the south is because in the wet season that's what Bradshaw training area looks like and it's just not usable. Malcolm, thank you. Thank you very much. Guy. Thanks very much, Malcolm. Um, and uh, before I uh, go into sort of Labor's response to the personnel and estate and infrastructure elements, I just want to give a little bit more background because uh, the background, uh, the, 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 the bio, which was, was lovely of you to read that out, uh, Malcolm, uh, but uh, it probably you're all scratching your heads at thinking, why is this woman engaged in defence? Uh, the reason I'm engaged in defence is because I've got a very strong interest in defence and uh, prior to me entering uh, the world of politics I actually had my own small business and I consulted with defence for 10 years. I worked uh, primarily in DMO uh, at the beginning when uh, DMO was actually created through the merger of DAO and uh, SCA and also JLC when Mick Roach was there and I also continued on when uh, Steve Gumley was there and he was very much involved in uh, the professionalising uh, approach as well as a range of other reforms. So I've sort of been through the many incarnations of DMO and now ultimately the demise of DMO. Uh, also, I worked in um, with Nick Warner when he was secretary. I worked in what was then the Fairness and uh, Equity or Fa Equity and Diversity uh, branch, as well as on Pam McKees in uh, in CFO. So I've worked in a broad range of areas across defence, and uh, Bill was aware of that. Uh, the fact that I have a strong interest in defence, I was on the defence subcommittee last in my first term, and uh, and so that's why he uh, promoted me to this uh, position. So uh, that gives you a bit more background. The fact that I it, 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 and I also have a very unhealthy healthy fascination with sustainment, as many of you in this room know, uh, particularly when you've been uh, attending uh, uh, JCPAA hearings, and I've been uh, pinging you on that. Uh, but it's, uh, thank you very much, Aspie, for inviting me today, and, uh, and it is a great pleasure to be here. And congratulations also on the, um, on the conference, as well as actually having these areas covered off, because as uh, Steve has said, uh, these areas don't tend to get much coverage. Uh, everyone gets fixated with the capability or the strategic components of these papers, and this is just as important, these enabling elements. And as, as Steve has said, there's a significant spend on it um, over the next decade and more. Uh, now, what I'm going to focus on today is essentially the personnel issues, uh, because that uh, is the area that my shadow portfolio area covers. I'll just touch very briefly on some responses on the defence estate as well as our infrastructure. But as you heard today from uh, Stephen Conroy, uh, we are broadly supportive of the, uh, of the white paper. Uh, Stephen highlighted some areas where we've sort of got not some concerns, but we are going to be keeping, keeping a watching brief. And that also goes uh, for the areas of uh, defence and state infrastructure and, and personnel. And I suppose for us, I mean, we've got this, uh, this fantastic uh, increase at the ADF uh, from 58,000 to 62,400. But there's going to be real challenges in actually reaching that, um, that target. And I suppose you've seen the white paper, you've seen the breakdown in terms of the requirements in the cyber sphere, the requirements in the ICT sphere, the requirements uh, for engineers, the requirements for um, uh, submariners. 
I know that Warren King's going to be speaking about uh, uh, submarines tomorrow and also the, uh, the, the uh, personnel uh, requirements of their future submarine um, uh, capability. So I, I'm just doing a little promo there for Warren's uh, speech tomorrow. But as, for, for Labor, we are, um, we are interested to see how we're actually going to achieve those submarin submariner targets. As you know, we've had challenges in achieving uh, submarin submariner targets to date. And, uh, and we've got very, very ambitious targets in the future. So we're going to be keeping a watching eye on that. Also, um, a watching uh, brief on the engineers. I met with uh, Engineers Australia yesterday, and there's a significant shortage. I, I know that many, most of you in this room will be aware of this. There's a significant shortage of engineers in Australia, and we're getting quite a lot from overseas. And uh, so, again, how are we going to... Uh, ensure that we meet the needs of um, the, the, our future strategic environment if we currently have a skill shortage in the area of engineers. We heard today from Alex as well about uh, the need for not just engineers but also STEM more broadly. Again, it's going to be a challenge and, uh, and we're going to be keeping an eye on what we're doing uh, in the, on that front, on the STEM front, and also particularly on getting women involved in, uh, in STEM. It's a nationwide challenge in terms of getting women involved in STEM. Both the uh, Coalition and Labor have uh, developed a range of strategies to get girls and young women into, uh, into STEM uh, degrees, uh, engaged in STEM at the, the primary school and secondary school level. As you know, we've got our coding in schools um, uh, program, particularly for girls. And so I think that that is an area that we really need to keep an eye on and we need to identify the fact that it is going to be a challenge and develop uh, strategies, meaningful strategies that are actually going to ensure that, as I said, we meet our st uh, the demands of our, um, our strategic future. We're also interested in uh, the, the white paper makes a very strong commitment to, um, to providing, uh, a com uh, ensuring that de defence is a, an employer of choice and that it remains competitive in the future. Uh, that's a great aspiration and we applaud that. But uh, that means we need to ensure that we are appropriately um, uh, ensuring that we've got an environment that uh, provides appropriate pay and conditions. And unfortunately, this government to date has not uh, been terribly... Uh, uh, well, the, the rhetoric hasn't matched the reality. Uh, we saw what happened with the ADF pay situation in 2014 uh, when Labor had to go in and ensure that uh, the ADF pay was actually keeping up with the cost of living. Uh, we got a reversal in the government's uh, um, uh, policy on that issue and, uh, and so we are going to ensure that the government actually lives up to its rhetoric, um, uh, makes its rhetoric reality when it comes to ADF paying conditions. That also goes for the APS. Uh, as you know, we've been in a, a very, very lengthy, um, across every government agency, very lengthy negotiations on enterprise agreements. The APS agreement's still ongoing in defence. Again, we're keeping a watching eye on that to ensure that the rhetoric matches reality in terms of paying conditions for the APS. Now, as you know, in the White Paper too, there's been a flag of a reduction in uh, the civilian workforce. That's been ongoing um, over the last, well, since this government's been um, in power. Uh, and so we're interested to, well, we are keeping an eye on that to ensure that, um, that those new military positions, those new ADF positions that are being created aren't actually filling the gaps that will be created as a result of those civilian uh, reductions. We're also going to be uh, keeping an eye on where, uh, where the redundancies are going to be and over what time frame. And, um, and also very much keeping an eye on the fact that these reductions uh, are carefully managed and uh, to ensure that we don't uh, get a loss of critical skills and expertise and experience. And I'm particularly thinking here in terms of those, those science, technology, engineering, um, uh, maths areas. Uh, we are going to be keeping a very close eye on that. Uh, also, um, in terms of the, uh, the reserves, we welcome the, um, the White Paper's continued continuation of the, uh, the One Defence notion, the integrated workforce, uh, and also the investment into the uh, infrastructure that supports uh, both reserves and cadets. 
Uh, I, in my former life, when I was consulting with Defence, I actually worked with the Australian Defence Force cadets for uh, about four years. It's a program that I think is, um, is underappreciated in some quarters uh, in Australia, certainly not in remote and regional Australia, uh, and we need to ensure that the facilities that we offer, both reservists as well as um, that youth development program, are kept up to date. And just while I'm on, touching on infrastructure, I know that, uh, again, from working in uh, cadets uh, those years back, I, we were involved in a very um, lengthy, pro a very comprehensive program right across the nation of bringing the buildings up to scratch uh, because that been, the responsibility had been devolved uh, and uh, these, th these buildings had sort of basically fallen in many cases to, in disrepair. And I know that uh, it, it, it was a very extensive program. I welcome this sort of refresh of that program and that investment in those facilities. But uh, there's been a lot of uh, conversations, a lot of speeches made in Parliament by my colleagues on, in the coalition on the fact that um, Townsville, various parts of remote and regional Australia are getting all this infrastructure investment as a result of the white paper. I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on that uh, because I know that uh, the, in terms of the building work that we did when we were with cadets, one of the, there was significant complaints, particularly from those remote and regional communities and the fact that the money wasn't actually going back into the local industries. Defence essentially had employed a prime uh, because uh, it was, well, they were getting better value for money, and I'm using that in the quotations because there are different interpretations of value for money. But they, the defence felt it got better value for money by employing a prime and then rolling out that one prime right across Australia for cadet work, or for those cadet building work, works. And so uh, we're going to be keeping a very close eye on the fact that these, my colleagues have got up in Parliament and said that there's going to be significant investment in their local industries in their small to micro businesses arising from the white paper, I'm going to be keeping a close eye on whether that actually happens, whether the work just goes to primes and uh, SMEs particularly get uh, just the crumbs from the table. So uh, that's just um, uh, what we're keeping an eye on in terms of infrastructure. In terms of the, um, uh, the defence estate, uh, we're keeping an eye on the disposal program. I know that uh, there was the 2012 um, uh, review that was done on that that identified the 17 sites. We're just getting visibility of what those sites are now. Uh, Steve mentioned, mentioned Belimba, which we knew about, but the others um, I, I don't think that I was aware of. So uh, it's, uh, we're going to be keeping a close eye on that. And, uh, and also the fact that the, F, uh, the first principles review flagged uh, or made that uh, recommendation, which I think is a significant recommendation on the fact that the public uh, joint standing, uh, the public works committee uh, that oversees a lot of the defence public work sites, uh, currently the, the, the threshold is uh, 2 million, I think, for um, a medium work and uh, 15 million, I think, for a major work. Uh, it has to go to, uh, to the uh, public works committee. I know that the FPR flagged uh, increasing that to 75 million, so again, I'll be keeping an eye on whether, what the government does on, in terms of responding to that recommendation. Uh, just finally, just uh, two points. First up, uh, defence families and the defence community. Again, there's a lot of um, really strong statements uh, in the white paper about the commitment to defence uh, communities and defence families. Just from meeting uh, defence families uh, since I've had this portfolio as shadow portfolio and also in my first term, I know that uh, there's a concern amongst some defence families that the, that the policies and processes aren't keeping up with the requirements of a modern family where there are two incomes and two professionals working. I know that uh, the women, uh, well, just, just from my own experience of being posted to India when I was with Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, my husband was the spouse, so to speak, and he was completely disempowered. He had to get me to sign off for everything. I understand, and this was 20 years ago, I understand there's still an element of that now um, with, uh, with defence families and the fact that the, the post of the ADF member actually has to sign off on sort of getting you know, a washer and a tap change. I mean, I'm taking, I'm using an extreme example, but they're the sorts of uh, uh, processes and policies that are incredibly outdated and outmoded and really don't keep, um, aren't keeping up to date with the requirements and autonomy of modern families. And so keeping an eye on what's actually taking place there. 
Uh, so, as I said, we are broadly supportive of the white paper. Um, we are broadly supportive of the defence of state infrastructure and personnel elements. We, I've just flagged a, number, a few areas where that, we'll, that we'll be watching over. Uh, and uh, we're broadly supportive of the ambitions as they're set out, uh, but we wait to see if the proof in the pudding. Thank you. Thanks, Guy. Um, okay, Lisa, you're, you're up. Great. Um, thanks, Malcolm. And I'm really pleased to take part in this uh, panel discussion today. Um, what I'll be focusing on, I think, is a very specific aspect of the, the personnel discussion, um, and that has to do with the issues of diversity, women, and also the related issue of gender advice and how it's integrated into defence capability. Um, as we've had a discussion today, and, and Malcolm alluded to it in his opening remarks to this panel discussion, and indeed John Howard, the former Prime Minister, referred to it last night, um, a lot of the focus and the ability and the enablers in defence go back to people. Um, that requires critical decisions about who decides to serve in the organisation and the civilians that enable it. Um, and it also requires skills and cultural values that embody the organisation and that they're able to promote and that enhance capability. So it's an issue that we haven't really focused on so far and I think it's quite pertinent that we're looking at this at this point in the conference discussions today about the white paper. So I thought I'd take us back to what the, the 2016 white paper says on some of these issues. And to quote, the strength of defence's leadership and its ability to adapt and embrace a more diverse and inclusive culture will be critical to attracting and retaining the workforce it needs for the future. Gender equality and increasing female participation in the defence workforce and in senior leadership roles is fundamental to achieving defence capability now and into the future. Defence has confronted the need for behavioural and attitudinal change with the release in 2012 of the Pathway to Change, Evolving cult Defence Culture. The Cultural Change Program continues to strengthen defence's capability through creating an organisation climate focused on diversity and inclusion that will attract the best people for the job. So I'll come back to some of these issues in a moment, but in preparing aspects of today's presentation, I went back and had a look at what previous white papers have done, which seems to be a, a very common approach. Um, and I think the overall assessment is that what we see in the 2016 Defence White Paper on a lot of these issues is really positive and builds on a lot of the progress that has taken place. If you go back to the 2000 Defence White Paper 15 years ago, um, you'll see that a lot of these terms barely rated a mention um, in that particular white paper. But if you look forward to 2009 and particularly 2013, what you are seeing is an involving interpretation um, of what issues of women's participation, um, the integration of gender advice, which actually I'll come back to in the 2016 paper, um, but diversity more broadly, um, mean and how that um, relates to defence capability. Um, and a number of these, I think, are a reflection of a lot of the uh, programs um, and policies that we see being implemented, particularly since 2012. So I think we've seen a lot of that progress and a lot of those investigations and discussions that have taken place that have been really important, picked up and reflected in this particular defence white paper. So firstly, I'll refer to the three different aspects I alluded to. Cultural change and diversity. So the paper acknowledges that Australia has made some good progress on implementing cultural change, yet there is more to be done. In particular, it talks about pathway to change, um, and we're in our, the fourth year of implementation of that program. Importantly, it notes that diversity and inclusion is not only essential in terms of reflecting the values of the defence organisation, but also as a means to recruit and attract the type of workforce required for the future. And it goes on to talk about the need for women, and this is something that Gay raised in her presentation, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds and people with disabilities. Um, and in fact, one of the observations that was made in the first principles review, and this had to do more specifically with the fact that defence as a public service employer tended to have people who served in it the longest out of all the public service agencies. One of the impediments of that was that that lack of diversity was contributing to an inability to change. So I think this raises a broader question about the ability for movement, um, the ability um, for agility in terms of careers, um, but also the, the um, benefits that having more diversity in the workforce bring. I think this is particularly relevant um, when we refer back to some of the strategic drivers identified in this white paper. We heard the Defence Minister this morning refer in particular to issues of terrorism and the threat that we see that's evolving in that context. 
So I think having a workforce uh, and defence organisation that is much more diverse, that has the involvement and participation of women, is a key enabler in terms of enhancing the capability to look at some of these threats that the defence organisation is going to continue to face. That brings me to women's participation. Um, I don't think I need to go into the statistics on this. As most of you know, it's hovering around 15%. It hasn't shifted dramatically in the last 20 years. It's hovered between 12 and 15%. Um, and that's despite um, the number of um, reforms and, and different programs that have started to be implemented. Again, I would say that this white paper points to a number of particularly important measures, whether it be looking at what's going to occur with the removal of gender restrictions, looking at the idea of targets and what they may mean for defence, and ensuring, I think this is particularly important, that women have access to leadership positions. Um, and the, a lot of those things are all acknowledged in the Defence White Paper. One of the things that I think is particularly innovative that is picked up is it refers to Australia's efforts to support the participation and integration of women into overseas national security institutions as part of training efforts in Afghanistan. Now, I think when you look at some of the things that Defence and the ADF have been undertaking in training missions, you look to some of the activities that we're currently undertaking in the Middle East, this is going to be an ongoing area of interest, and I think considering what that means in the context of women's participation in particular, and reflecting on Australia's experience, um, is going to be key in that area. Finally, the issue of gender advice. Um, now, this is not a personnel issue per se. I think I should make that distinction. Um, I think there is a tendency to say women and gender are sort of the one thing and they get lumped together. But this is actually, it's related to women's participation, but it's also distinct. And in fact, gender advisors don't necessarily have to be female. Uh, those providing gender advice don't necessarily have to be female. Um, but this is an aspect that was recognised for the first time in this white paper. And I think that's, that's a key move that has been recognised and it's significant. Um, the area that it referred to um, in terms of the importance of gender advice had to do with the uh, deployment of ADF officers into gender advisor roles to the NATO-led mission in Afghanistan. So this was an important development um, and it was good to see it recognised. I would probably say it could have gone a little bit further in recognising how comprehensive and how key this is to the issue of capability and skills within the ADF. Um, and I've noted this previously, I will say in, in um, published pieces, um, but it only captures part of the effort and overlooks many of the other benefits afforded by gender, gender advice to military commanders, including in the areas of operational planning training and execution. Um, and I will come back to this in, in, in looking at, at some of this. Um, so I'll move on. What are some of the challenges and opportunities that this presents um, going forward? So as I said, it's a good start, and I think we've seen some key progress that's taken place in this white paper, but I wanted to have a look at four things going forward. First of all, looking at um, the strategic drivers that were identified in the white paper. And I think the importance and what this paper signifies is enhancing or building on this discussion that's really been reflected in numbers um, and moving it more to one of looking at future capability. And it's something that's alluded to quite a bit in the white paper. Um, and I think this is going to be key in impl implementation in looking at how these two are linked. Of the six key strategic drivers that are identified in the white paper, and I know this was referred to in the previous panel, we had the reference to the enduring threat of terrorism and state fragility, in particular, are two that I would highlight. So there are particularly important contexts there, whether it's the ADF providing humanitarian and disaster relief in our region, whether it's supporting peacekeeping operations, whether it's trying to address some of the root causes of conflict in the way that we look at employing defence in its activities in coordination with the rest of government. Issues such as having diversity, ensuring the participation of women, um, in terms of the context of these threats and also the integration of gender advice will continue to be key. Um, moving on to the second point, and I won't go on to this in, in too much detail because I think Gay's referred to it, a key challenge in terms of this implementation going forward will of course be recruitment and retention. Um, so again, to support a lot of these initiatives, you're going to need the key upfront recruitment programs, but I think the retention is also going to be a really key component. <coughs> So having a lot of statements, and we've seen very positive statements from senior leadership on a lot of these issues, but I think a key challenge going forward is going to be to ensure that sort of that middle level of leadership, it's part of the culture, it's part of the accountability systems that are being integrated into the process. And that brings me to the third point in terms of the importance of leadership and accountability on these issues. Um, there are a number of measures in place. Defence is responsible for 17 out of the 24 recommendations in Australia's National, National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. 
Um, you have the pathway to change program that's in the process of implementation. I think there is a really solid framework there that sets forward a lot of the agenda and will provide the foundation for implementing a number of these measures in the defence white paper. Um, but a lot of that is going to come back to leadership and ensuring people are accountable for implementing it. Um, and looking at what some of the reasons are that perhaps women are opting out and that's becoming a retention issue. Finally, and the point I'll conclude on briefly, um, is I think there's a broader question, and it wasn't touched upon too much in the white paper, but of how these issues are implemented in terms of international engagement and strategic policy. So we have had discussion this morning about the emphasis in this white paper, in particular on defence international engagement programs. In fact, the Minister for Defence referred to it as a core function. In terms of our bilateral relationship with our most important partner with the United States, we've seen some great progress in this area. Um, Exercise Talisman Sabre last year had the integration of gender advisors. It had a heavy emphasis on women, peace and security. It was included in the communique um, that came out from Osmin at the very strategic political level. So I think the challenge going forward will be to ensure that these issues are raised to that strategic level um, in these political dialogues, in our bilateral defence programs, in the strategic documents that we set out. Um, and I think the broader point to conclude on is that it's not just an issue for, for defence, the ADF and the public service, but I think also looking at the role that industry plays in a lot of these issues and what they're doing to support them as well more broadly. And on that note, I will conclude. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was excellent, all, all three of you. I'll kick off the Q&A with a question to Steve. Um, we talk about the future strategic outlook. Uh, you know, my personal perspective is, is going to get worse rather than better. Uh, particularly given the rise of China. And so that's going to accentuate the likelihood that the US will seek to deepen its rebalance into Asia, assuming you have Hillary Clinton in the White House and not Donald Trump. Um, so let's assume that we do have Clinton and the rebalance deepens and the Americans say to us, look, we want to actually significantly increase our presence on Australian facilities. How prepared is the Department of Defence to adapt to a, to a short notice requirement to substantially increase the US presence in, here in Australia. Mm. So um, many of you might be aware that we're in negotiations with the US at the moment about the um, ongoing marine rotational force uh, that we've had. I think we've had it here three times at, at, at about 1,200 Marines plus their equipment. Um, and we're talking about um, scaling that into the future. Uh, clearly, the negotiations that the department is having with um, with the US are all subject to uh, respective governments' final sign-off and agreement. Mm. Um, but um, for those with long memories, um, and by long in this case I mean about 25 minutes, um, the gelato chart uh, that I put up had a um, significant wedge of black um, near the top of the chart, and that black is the um, assumed, uh, assumed funding for um, infrastructure work around uh, the US force posture work in the future. So we're, um, we're well advanced in thinking about that, uh, but of course, um, government to government agreements are not yet, are not yet concluded, um, and we're ready to start moving on that as and when those agreements uh, come, in, come into place. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, Anthony, so can you wait for the mic, please? Yep. Anthony Bergen from Aspie. Um, question for Gay and one for Steve. Um, Paul Dibb earlier this, today pointed out we've got an ADF of 57,000 that's given responsibility for its missions across 20% of the globe. Now, Senator Conroy in his address this morning didn't raise the question of the size of the ADF. So I guess, Gabe, my question to you is, does Labor have a policy on the actual size of the, of the Defence Force? Do you, does Labor want to expand the numbers or keep them the same? Um, to Steve, my question is, you, your, apropos your comments about um, um, rationalising the defence estate, I mean, the biggest challenge uh, that I can see to that is politics, um, the politics of base closure. And I would like to get your view on whether we need something like what the United States has, that independent commission on, uh, on base closure. Do you think we need something outside the defence bureaucracy to advise government on 
the agenda that you outlined for us this afternoon? Just in terms of the, uh, the figures, I mean, as I said, we're broadly supportive of, of the, the, the personnel chapter generally in, uh, in the white paper. Uh, and, uh, but as I said, we want to ensure that the, those additional military personnel aren't filling gaps in the civilian uh, that have been created as a result of the reduction of civilian positions. Uh, so, yeah, we, and I mean, you heard um, Stephen make the comments on the 2% of GDP, so essentially we are broadly supportive of these figures. So uh, on the base rationalisation, um, Gay mentioned a, a 2012 report, which we, was, uh, we concluded following some years work at the time, which made recommendations for uh, defence to, over a period of about 15 to 20 years, move out of 17 um, significant establishments. And I can't talk about what they are because that's um, not, not information we're putting out into the public domain. But we have had a couple of decisions out of government around two of those places uh, in the last nine months, and that's uh, good progress. Um, it's always a long-term it's always a long-term uh, endeavor uh, and particularly uh, as we look to the sort of 50-year future um, probably some of the defense bases uh, are in the wrong place at the moment and um, when we look at um, urban encroachment and a range of other factors around some bases we probably don't want to be in them in the long-term future so we need to start sourcing alternatives um, would I like a, um, a process like, like the US have, which takes, to some extent, takes the issue of which base might be closed out of politics? Um, it, it's really, I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Um, it, um, it, has its own, it has its own issues as well. Um, we, uh, we work with government uh, around uh, the various proposals that we have. Um, the first principles review did make a recommendation that, that the government should just agree to the 17 and, and get on with it, but the government agreed in principle that recommendation, but said they'd look case by case at, um, at rationalisation proposals as they came forward. So we've, we've taken a few proposals forward, had a couple agreed, um, and we'll be taking forward more proposals over the next, um, next year or so. Um, and a, a lot of them are not in the next year. You know, we might take a proposal forward now for a base to close in maybe five or six years' time, because um, one of the other funding lines in the gelato chart is um, at the very top, a, a blue line, is a sort of capital reinvestment we need to, to undertake if we're going to move units from one place to another. And so sometimes these things uh, take a while. Um, in, in many areas, um, we are approached by industry um, and local government um, asking if there's a possibility that defence land can be made available for um, alternative use uh, that, that might suit the, uh, the local council or the town better. So. Uh, I'm not sure if we need a different process, but certainly uh, we're gonna, we are trying really hard to make progress on rationalising the footprint. Just before we go on to that, I yep. just want to clarify too, just um, in terms of the, the figures, I meant the ADF figures, in terms of the civilian, we've been concerned about the reduction in civilian um, jobs for, um, well, since this government's been in. And as I said uh, in my opening remarks, I just, I, we, we need to ensure that uh, we're not losing out on critical skills, uh, particularly in those STEM areas. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we are keeping a close eye on the, the fact that um, those military positions aren't actually being used to fill those gaps on those civilian areas. Okay, next question. Uh, everyone, yes, gentleman down here. Just wait for the microphone, if you could. Uh, it's to the panel, and I'm sort of loosely tying it on diversity, um, but I have an interest in the Indigenous, supporting the Indigenous activities in Australia. And there's a couple of programs that I think, and I'd, I'd like your view on how it's going. Uh, one is the government's policy on uh, Indigenous procurement policy. Um, and I think it comes back to Gay's point too. Sometimes primes sit between agencies, and such as yours, do where you're operating, and the Indigenous community and trying to uh, bridge that gap and I'd like your views on how that's going and what could be done to improve it and Gay, I think the other side of that is cadets um, and reserves can form a really big part in helping Indigenous communities and your thoughts on that. 
I'll start. That's okay. yeah. So, um, for those not aware, the government produced a new indigenous procurement policy last year. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it built on the existing Commonwealth procurement rules, which have um, a clause 17 in them that allows a Commonwealth procurement agency uh, like mine to sole source to an indigenous company uh, rather than go through a competitive process. Uh, um, and when you sole source, you still have to demonstrate value for money and the like, but it's, um, it, it, was a, it was something that had been little used uh, for what you might call any significant work. Um, but last year, Defence was the first, uh, the first entity in the Commonwealth to place what we call a significant contract. Uh, in this case, it was a $6 million building and construction contract uh, with a Sydney-based Indigenous company, 100% Indigenous owned, uh, to do uh, building works uh, around the um, LHD uh, facilities that we built in Garden Island and Sydney. Uh, and on the back of that, uh, we're now, um, we've now placed something like um, uh, 20 to 25 contracts with other indigenous companies across a range of spheres, not all in my space, some of them ICT contracts, uh, but, but quite a lot of building and construction contracts. Um, it's, uh, so the, the new IPP has really given a boost uh, to uh, this, this uh, Commonwealth agencies looking at what you can do to use, if you're honest, clauses that already existed to enable sole sourcing to indigenous companies. Uh, I, uh, I talk frequently to Supply Nation, which is the, uh, if you like, the peak body that the, uh, the new policy uh, recognises as the place you go to confirm that a company is, you know, uh, more than 50% owned by an indigenous entity. Um, and they have some great ideas about how we can uh, go forward. And I'll just put one of them in the room right now. Um, some people who are spinning out of Supply Nation um, uh, have got a great idea about um, the shipbuilding program that this country is about to embark on. And they come out with some rather disappointing but compelling statistics. Um, the, the NBN program, National Broadband Network, something of the order of a $50 billion program, whatever, um, uh, we, can't find, we can't find that a single contract associated with the NBN program has been placed with an indigenous owned company, not one. And yet, they operate under the same rules that I do about you can sole source, use Exemption 17. Mm. Now, so, so armed with that information, these, these people are now are out and about talking to people like myself, they're talking to um, Kim Gillis, talking to Navy, and they're saying, we'd like to get involved in this nation's shipbuilding program. We don't want to build ships because we're just, you know, generally smaller indigenous companies, but we'd like to get involved. We'd like a small start in what looks like a 50-year endeavour by, by this country, and how can you help us? So if you're out there and you're in industry, and you want to learn who these people are, I'd be very happy to introduce you to them. They don't want to build ships, they just want a foot in the door, small contracts associated with the whole process that can grow over decades into business opportunities. Just in terms of the indigenous procurement, uh, the, as, as you make mention, Warren, it's, uh, it's, it is how you work around the primes, uh, and so therefore you need to have a mechanism where you can go direct to the indigenous uh, small business. I mean, this is a challenge, just having battled the, the behemoth of defence as a, as a micro uh, when I had my own business. It is, it's a challenge for every um, um, micro and small, uh, and indigenous businesses are much the same or there may be a need for a compulsion or, um, or a target, no, rather than compulsion, a target for the primes to actually engage with um, Indigenous businesses. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, you do need to have a very tailored uh, approach to it that's been developed uh, with this particular strategy and it needs to be very focused and, and, uh, and uh, innovative in terms of the way we go about procurement. As, as that they're of course all in keeping with the PGPA Act, but uh, uh, also we need to, um, yeah, as, as Steve mentioned, possibly sole sourcing is the option there. I mean, there's challenges with that too. So, uh, and now just uh, more broadly on uh, Indigenous cadets. Yes, when I was working with cadets, we had a um, an, in, a number of Indigenous units, uh, one on Palm Island. Uh, one that I went to in Bamaga, another on Thursday Island and another in Nullumboy. And uh, I understand now that the cadet program, the Indigenous cadet program has been merged into the more broader Indigenous strategy in defence. 
uh, there's still a very healthy uh, Indigenous cadet program going. I saw the difference it made to those, uh, to those young people in those remote areas. Uh, I saw the difference cadet ma cadets makes to young Australians in remote areas generally, but particularly in the, to those Indigenous kids. And um, the beauty about those programs too, it's tailored to the, like the Thursday Island, it's very much about a maritime program. Uh, and so I think that uh, you do, we do need to actually have a program specifically designed um, for young Indigenous Australians to ensure that they actually get an understanding of how uh, the ADF works and um, that, that the self-esteem and leadership that you get from the cadet program. Uh, and, uh, and, but I understand that that's continuing and I say all power to it. It's a very powerful program, as I said, not just for Indigenous cadets but for remote and regional Australia more generally. Okay, we have time for one more question. Anyone? Okay, in that case, I won't keep you from your afternoon tea. I'd like to, to thank uh, Steve, Guy, and Lisa for an excellent series of presentations. Please thank them. And thank you all. <laughs>